Previously on World History and Geography. Between 40,000 and 10,000 BCE, during the last ice age, it is believed our human ancestors migrated over the land bridge connecting Afro-Eurasia to the Americas. Eventually, civilizations arose, including the Mayan civilization in Mesoamerica around 1,800 years ago. While the Maya were developing their civilization to the south, other high cultures were evolving in central Mexico. Some of the most important developments took place in and around the Valley of Mexico. This valley, where modern Mexico City is located, eventually became the site of the greatest empire of Mesoamerica, the Aztec. Around the same time in South America, another civilization thrived, the Inca. And now, our feature presentation. Following the early civilizations of Teotihuacan, and the Toltecs in the Valley of Mexico, the Aztecs arrived around 1200 CE. The Aztecs, who were then called the Mexica, settled on a small island in Lake Texacoco at the center of the valley. There in 1325 CE, they founded their city, which they named Well, we're waiting. Tenochtitlan. Hey, I said it. In 1428, they joined two other cities to form the Triple Alliance, what we now think of as the Aztec Empire. The Aztecs based their power on military conquest and on the tribute they gained from their conquered subjects. This tribute was in the form of gold, maize, cacao beans, cotton, jade, and other products. If local rulers failed to pay tribute or offered any kind of resistance, the Aztecs responded with brutal force. The three broad social classes of Aztec society were the nobles, made up of government officials, priests, and military leaders at the top, then the commoners, made up of merchants, artisans, soldiers, and farmers. The lowest class, enslaved persons, were captives who did many different jobs. The emperor, with absolute power, sat atop the Aztec social pyramid. By the early 1500s, Tenochtitlan had become a major urban center. With a population between 200 and 400,000 people, it was larger than London or any other European capital of the time. To connect the island to the mainland, Aztec engineers built three raised roads, called causeways, over the water and marshland. Other smaller cities ringed the lake, creating a dense concentration of people in the Valley of Mexico. Canals, streets, and broad avenues connected the city center with outlying residential districts. At the center of the city was a massive walled complex, filled with palaces, temples, and government buildings. The main structure in the complex was the Great Temple. This giant pyramid had twin temples at the top, one dedicated to the rain god and the other dedicated to the sun god. The pyramid served as the center of the Aztec religious life. Aztec religious practices centered on elaborate public ceremonies designed to communicate with the gods and win their favor. The most important rituals involved the sun god, Hutsuchulopochtli. Huitzilopochtli. Huitzilopochtli. According to Aztec belief, Huitzilopochtli made the sun rise every day. When the sun set, he had to battle the forces of evil to get to the next day. To make sure that he was strong enough for this ordeal, he needed the nourishment of human blood. Without regular offerings of human blood, Huitzilopochtli would be too weak to fight. The sun would not rise. The world would be plunged into darkness and all life would perish. For this reason, Aztec priests practiced human sacrifice on a massive scale. Each year, thousands of victims, usually enslaved persons and criminals, as well as people offered as tribute by conquered provinces, were led to the altar on top of the great temple, where priests carved out their hearts using obsidian knives. I'm not feeling so good. In 1502, a new ruler, Montezuma II, was crowned emperor. Under Montezuma, the Aztec Empire began to weaken. Montezuma demanded more tribute and sacrifice. Oh, come on, enough of the blood. Anyway, Montezuma demanded more tribute and sacrifice from the provinces, who then rose up against Aztec oppression, beginning a period of unrest and rebellion. Soon afterward, fair-skinned bearded strangers arrived from across the sea and ended the mighty Aztec empire. Further south in the high mountain valleys of the Andes, another empire was developing, one that would transcend the Aztec empire in land area, power, and wealth. In the Andes Mountains of South America, the Inca people settled on fertile lands in the Valley of Cusco. By the 1200s, they had established their own small kingdom in the valley. The Inca believed that the Incan ruler was descended from the sun god, Inti, who would bring prosperity and greatness to the Incan state. In 1438 CE, a powerful and ambitious ruler, Pachacuti, which means earth shaker, took the throne. Under his leadership, the Inca used diplomacy and military force to conquer all of Peru and then moved into neighboring lands. By 1500, 
the Inca ruled an empire that stretched 2,500 miles along the western coast of South America, becoming the largest empire ever seen in the Americas. To control the huge empire, including Lake Titicaca, Okay, okay, let's not get carried away. Cause we really like saying its name, Titicaca! The rulers divided the territory and its people into manageable units, governed by a central bureaucracy. They also imposed a single official language and founded schools to teach Incan ways. It controlled most economic activity, regulating the production and distribution of goods. Unlike the Maya and the Aztecs, the Inca allowed little private commerce or trade. The main demand the Incan state placed on its subjects was for tribute, usually in the form of labor. The labor tribute was known as Mida. It required all able-bodied citizens to work for the state a certain number of days every year. Mida workers might labor on state farmlands, or produce craft goods for state warehouses, or help with public works projects, like the Incan road system. The 14,000 mile long network of roads and bridges helped unite the empire, traversing rugged mountains and harsh deserts. The roads ranged from paved stone to simple paths. A system of runners known as Shaskis traveled these roads as a kind of postal service, carrying messages from one end of the empire to the other. Bridges would be made from grass. Yes, grass. The Inca people would make rope out of long, dry grass and create bridges from the rope as they still do today. That's a bridge made from grass. That's totally awesome. Anyway, historians have compared the Incan ruling system to a type of socialism or modern welfare state. Citizens were expected to work for the state and were cared for in return. For example, the aged and disabled were often supported by the state. The government also made sure that the people did not go hungry when there were bad harvests. Squashed, freeze-dried potatoes. Wait, is it potatoes or potatoes? Okay, squished potatoes called chuño, yummy were stored in huge government warehouses for distribution in times of food shortages. Look, it's a llama! Or is it an alpaca? Hmm. Hey, why did the llama cross the road? Because it was the chicken's day off! <laughs> Despite the sophistication of many aspects of Incan life, the Incan never developed a writing system. History and literature were memorized as part of an oral tradition. For numerical information, the Inca created an accounting device known as a quipu, a set of knotted strings that could be used to record data. The knots and their position on the string indicated numbers. Additionally, the colors of the strings represented different categories of information important to the government. Machu Picchu, the most well-known of the Inca cities, had a sun temple, public buildings, and a central plaza. Some sources suggest it was a religious center. Others think it was an estate of the emperor, or the nobility. Anyway, in the 1520 CE, the emperor died and the empire was split between his two sons. At first, the system of dual emperors worked. Soon, however, Atahualpa laid claim to the whole of the empire. A bitter civil war followed and Atahualpa eventually defeated his brother, but the war tore apart the empire. The Spanish arrived in the last days of this war, taking advantage of Incan weakness, and would soon defeat the Inca and control most of the new world. Ladies and gentlemen, it is finished. The end has come.